Hi there. In this, hopefully the final part of my tutorial on creating a lakeside scene, we're going to cover how to do all the finer details now that just hopefully make it a more pleasing scene. So you can see we've got a load of grass here. We're going to do the grass. I'll try and cover the ivy on this tree over here. We'll put some wildflowers like these around the scene and we'll cover putting a few rocks in around the scene as well. And then a few of the effects that create the feeling that certain parts of the scene are at a greater distance. There is actually a slight sort of fogginess to the objects that are in the distance here. So you can see this is where we got to with the tutorial. There's a little bit of noise here and we'll certainly do something about that as we go along. And we can also see through these trees to the background as well. So I think we'll just do something about that to begin with. Obviously we could just do a lot more trees but already on my computer we were up to half a million vertices which is quite a lot in a scene and Blender's starting to struggle a little bit there. At some point, my graphics card is, is going to be unable to render it and I'd have to switch to CPU mode. And also, there's no real need to do that. So what I'm going to do is just put something behind there to help hide the fact that those trees are just a shallow block of trees, as it were. So I'm just going to just show you what we've got at the moment. So let's go to my particle system on the ground, on the land, and just switch off the visibility of it. By leaving the camera icon on, it will still render when I do a render, but it won't show in the preview screen because I've turned the little eye symbol off. And you can see we're down to two and a half thousand vertices now, so that's fine. And I know basically what I'm seeing is the sky behind this little ridge here. So I'm gonna add images as planes. Now you may not have that immediately visible and it's not essential to do it this way, but it just saves a little time. If you go to user preferences and start typing images, you can see there's an option to set import images as planes. And it just saves you a little bit of time. So make sure that's ticked. So I'm going to add a mesh, which is images as planes. And all I really want is a bit of a landscape scene that's got trees in it. I'm not going to use alpha trees. You could use something that's got effectively the top sky part is an alpha texture so that you can see the top of the trees behind the ones you've got, but it's not essential to do that. So I'm just going to use these here called trees. I think these came from CG textures as usual. And I'll just say import. You can see there it is there. Let's scale it up a bit. Just rotate it slightly and bring it up here. If we go to material, we can see there it is. I'm going to stretch it in the Z a little bit. Now, one of the problems at the moment is that this will actually cast shadows. I'm just going to bring it so it just intersects with the land a little bit just to make sure it's close. To stop it casting shadows on the scene, I'm going to come over to the object properties. I'm just going to call this landscape BG for background. So come down on the object properties under cycle settings. We'll turn off shadow so that will no longer cast any shadows in the scene if we decide to have our sun coming from this way this object won't cast shadows now it's got quite a lot of sky in it so i'm going to make it a little taller again it doesn't matter too much that i'm stretching the trees because they're not really going to be visible other than a little bit at a time make it even bigger on that axis i think i'm also going to subdivide it again as i say you can use an alpha but this is good enough for what we're going to do and now just go to face select and i'm just going to remove some of the faces. I don't want it too tall. It's really just these lower part of the trees that I'm looking for. So I'm just going to delete those faces. And you could obviously do that in finer detail, but that will do for now. What you can also do is you can set this under the material. If we have a look at the node setup, you can see it's got an image texture here fed into a node, and it's actually allowed for transparency as well. So if you have an image with a transparent sky, if you use images as planes, the default will automatically bring in the transparent. As it happens, we haven't got any transparency on this, so we don't need that. And it's just a straightforward diffuse going into the surface. Now we could use an emission shader. The advantage of the emission shader is that this will always be the brightness that it is. That can give you some problems though. It can sort of shine too brightly through the trees. So it will look actually like a plane that's got the sun shining on it even if the sun's coming from the other side whereas you'll get some variation when you use just a diffuse like this we don't want any reflective elements or anything like that so if we look through our camera it's probably too big and we'll go to render view we'll bring up the sun 
and then we'll bring up the visibility of our tree particle system. So you can see the one behind it is a little big at the moment, but already you can see it's starting to fill in the gaps. So you can see what I meant now about the fact that we don't, we're don't, not too worried necessarily about the top of the trees, except possibly here, but that's just because of the distribution that I've got. If I bring in my main trees as well, that's the water and then the trees themselves. So you can now see we really don't need the top of that at all. So I'll turn the particle system off. Perhaps we'll uh, subdivide once more, go to material view, and it's just trim the top of that off like that and then bring our particle trees back again. We just don't need to see the top of these at all. So I may as well get rid of that. More vertices I don't need. It's really not the top that I want. It's what's going on down here that's of interest to me. In fact, before I do that, what I think I'll do is I'm going to actually lower it down because it's really the trees that I'm curious about and the trunks and things like that. Obviously, if I rearrange my particle trees, I may need to revisit this background. And if you have a background with a transparent sky, then you don't need to do this necessarily, depending on how well it's been done. I can just see one more left there. So let's see what that looks like. So you can see it's a lot darker now. If I show you what it would look like with an emission shader on, and you may decide you want to use an emission shader depending on the setup of your scene and so on. So I'll put an emission shader here and take the color to there. And now I'm just going to swap over the surface to the emission shader. So now you can see it's showing through. So that's not entirely what you necessarily want to see. You just have to work out for yourself whether that looks right. For you. Obviously you can darken it down by even reducing the strength. So if I go down to 0.2 perhaps, that's much darker now and sort of looks okay. It's still sort of glowing slightly through there. And you need to modify the color balance and so on. And really, I need trees that are in autumn as well, that sort of thing. I think we'll, we'll stay with the mission, but I'm going to go down to point 0.1, so it's very dark indeed. I'm just going to hide our particle trees and then add a color node, we'll go with color, and then I'm just going to change this just to give us a slightly more reddish, yellowish sort of color so it doesn't stand out from the other trees quite so much. Perhaps we don't need it quite so dark now. There we go. And turning our particle trees back on again. And there we go. So now we haven't got that sky showing through behind it. So we'll hide our particle trees again. We'll actually name this particle system now. So this is trees. All this trees as well. We'll make this window a bit bigger. So we're ready to do a little bit more now. So we'll put some rocks on next, I think. So we'll come over to here. And this is some assets that I've added in and we'll use in a minute. But we need to create a few rocks now. So I'm just going to add a mesh, which is just going to be an icosphere, but we'll go with one subdivision to start with. And we're going to say new on the material, we'll call this rock material, call the object small rock. We'll add a principled shader in there, into the surface, and we'll add texture, which is an image texture. And it doesn't matter too much. These are the small rocks anyway, and you won't really see it. But to fit the sort of nature of the scene, I think we might want more of a sort of yellowy, greeny rock. Perhaps we'll go with this one. It's got a fair bit of green on it. We'll give that a go. And then put that into the color input on the principal shader. And obviously we get nothing to begin with, and that's because it's not unwrapped. So rather than unwrapping this, what we can do is use an input, which is a texture coordinate input, and plug that into the vector input. It's stretching in various places, but this is a very small rock, so it doesn't matter too much. We'll just try some different options. We can try object, which is most typically the one that I go with for objects like this. We also want to set this to smooth shading. It's going to be very, very small, so we're not really going to see the angular nature of the object. The next thing you want to do is add a simple deform modifier. I'm also going to add an empty. I'll just put that here. I'm now going to select the empty as the reference for this modifier. And now when I move my rock around, you can see it actually changes shape depending on where it is relative to the empty. So that's now an easy way to create a variety of shaped rocks. And then we can select different types of distortion. It's all reference to the original position of the rock. Twist is probably fine. It doesn't really matter. I'm not using it to an extreme. So then I can just create duplicates with Shift D. And each of them being in a slightly different position has a slightly different shape. I can actually leave them like that, but what I'm going to do is just apply. You don't necessarily need to do, but it's not adding geometry. I'm just going to apply the modifier. 
and just move that empty over here. So that's my small rock collection. You'll notice there's an issue with the origin. So we just need to go to Object, Transform, Origin to Geometry and do that for each of them. And that just puts that little yellow orange dot back in the center of the rock. We don't want it unlike the trees at the edge of the rock unless we want the whole rock protruding from the ground. What we actually want is the rock to be buried in the ground somewhat. So it's a good thing to have the origin somewhere embedded inside the rock. So we'll select each of these rocks now. Control G and we'll call this small rock group. And we'll move those over here and we'll create another rock group. This one will again use the icosphere, but we'll use two levels for this one because this is going to be a higher resolution rock. Initially, we'll go with, we'll call it large rocks and we'll go with the same rock material. So to begin with, I'm going to actually shape this rock a little bit. We'll make him a little flatter and then perhaps select a couple of faces, turn on proportional editing and just scale those faces just so it's more rock shaped. We'll set it to smooth shading and again, we'll add our simple deform modifier, bring our empty into view and select that empty as our control object. And now we'll create a few copies of them. Perhaps we'll try for some different distortion options as well. Just apply the modifier now. Now we can get rid of the empty and of course put the origin back where it belongs. And this time, go to the material and we'll click this little number and we'll call this rock large material now. So we've got a unique material. We just need to select each of them and make sure we select rock large. We should probably have done this at the beginning, really. But it's no different at the moment. It's an identical material, just with a different name. The reason I did that, though, is I want to now changing this to UV on all of those objects. And I'm just going to say sphere projection. And you can see we've got quite a different look. If you get this error at the top when you unwrap something, it's just because the object hasn't had its rotation and scale applied, which doesn't matter too much. I'm just going into edit mode, select all the vertices, press U, and you can try Smart UV Project, but you'll get quite a lot of lines potentially. But let's try it with this one as well and see what that looks like. It all depends on the object. And obviously, if you really need to, you may need to properly unwrap the object. But even these large rocks, we're never going to see all of the rock and they're never going to be a major part of the scene. So you can try some of the different options and see how they look. What you may need to do, and I'm fairly happy with the scale on this one, is come over to the UV image editor, select the rock texture. Now you can see what it really looks like. Open your rock and have a look at what we've got. So if the scale isn't looking right, you can rescale it in here. Now, obviously, you don't really want to go out Side the limits of this image unless this is a tileable image. In other words, things here match up with things here and so on, but this isn't tileable. It looks to me like I could do with is perhaps scaling on the X a little bit and then perhaps scaling down a little bit on the Y just to make it look a little less stretched. It really doesn't matter that much. And if you see a rock that's not looking quite right, you can always change the distribution of your particle system, as you'll see in a moment. So that's not too bad. Just like with an object, you can just press A to select all the vertices in here in the UV image editor. OK, so there's our larger rock, but it's just a very basic texture in both cases at the moment. With the small ones, I'm not too worried at the moment, but I think we do need to put a little bit of reflective on there. In order to make it easy to edit both of these different textures, I'm actually going to add a second texture to one of the rocks which won't be visible because I'm not going to apply it to any of the vertices. And we'll just select rock there. So you can see it's almost the same. I'm going to bring up the land and the sun. And we'll just go to rendered view. And it's not looking too bad already. So I'm going to make sure I've got my large rock texture selected. I'm going to add color ramp, and drop that in there. And the rocks are going to go black and white. And then I'm going to narrow these points together because I'm looking for surface features or textures. Now, I'm just playing with something called Materialize, which is a new free tool to allow you to process images to produce things like normal maps and so on, which help to add apparent geometry to the surface. But I'm not going to do that in this case. I'm just going to do things very simply. And certainly I'll do a video about using tools like that in the near future. I'll set this to Cardinal, I think, which is sort of sharper fall off. When you click this button, it just swaps these two points over. I'm going to use this for creating bumps on the surface. So it's finding where in the image bright and dark spots are there that's better bearing in mind that by default at least the dark spots will be the low points on the rock and the bright spots the higher point that sort of gives you the impression that there's cracks and holes in the rock and that's what I'm looking for if we go to B spline it will give you a much smoother sort of look 
but that means you'll generally have to have these points closer together to get a more defined surface texture. So that will do for that. If I take that out of there now, we've just got a basic white, I'll make it slightly darker, grayish rock. I'm gonna add a vector node, which is a bump node. I'm gonna connect that into the normal input down here, and I'm gonna take the output of my color ramp into the height on that node. And you can see we've immediately got some surface features on there. They're a bit extreme at the moment, so we can come to the strength and just turn that down quite a bit. And now you can start to see we're getting a bit more features on the surface. And now we can add our color back in, and that will just give us the idea of shadows and things like that. I think we go a little bit lower with the strength. Now what we haven't got on these rocks yet is proper reflection. I'm going to turn the roughness up a little bit. If I turn the roughness right down, you can see our rocks are much brighter. So roughness basically, as you go up, the surface becomes more diffuse really. So there it is completely up. Every part, including the dark parts, are reflecting light in a very even way. There's no bright little reflections. So I'm going to go for a roughness sort of 0.3 and we'll leave it there. I must say I'm still finding the principled shader a little more difficult to set up than using discrete nodes, but I'm forcing myself to carry on using it. It is supposed to handle things like reflections a little more realistically. I just think perhaps some of the naming conventions on here aren't completely intuitive. So that's our rocks created. Perhaps we can darken them a little bit by just adding a gamma node in here and we just turn that up a little bit. Once the shaders have caught up, you can see they're a little bit darker now. And then I'm just going to copy these three nodes to the rock texture which is for the small rocks. Doesn't matter so much for those because obviously they are a lot tinier, but we'll put it in anyway. That means we've got the same effect on the small rocks. So let's come over to our landscape again. And if we go to our landscape in edit mode, unselect everything and just say canvas, if you remember, this is showing us the nearby area that things can exist on. If I now select canvas different and say select that as well, we've now got both. So I'm now going to say plus to add a new vertex group. I'm going to call this grass and rocks. And I'm just going to assign to that. So basically the areas of landscape visible both close and near to the camera and far away are now part of this vertex group. And I can see I probably need to select these as well because some of the things I'm going to be adding might be tall enough to reach into the camera from down here. So we'll just assign again. And if I unselect everything and reselect, there they are. If I bring my water back in and have a look, we can actually see we need to select a little bit more down here as well. So I'm just going to come along here, deselect that bit there and just assign again. There's probably some behind this little hill that we don't need, but don't worry about that. And there is one there I can see as well will assign that. So we've now got a good amount of land assigned. So we're ready to add the next particle system now. So I'm just going to click the plus here. We're going to call this small rocks. And we'll call it small rocks there. It's just one of those funny things about Blender where you just seem to have to name particle systems in two places. It's a hair system because we don't want them dropping and moving around and things like that. We'll leave it at a thousand, but we'll say use modifier stack. Use modifier stack just means if I've added a subdivision surface that's still active on the landscape, it will use the new geometry created by that or any other modifier in order to determine where to put particles. It won't just stick with the original geometry. We want to render the ground, so that's fine. We'll say group and we'll say the small rock group. It looks like I haven't created my large rock group yet. We'll say use rotation and pick random. And if I go back to my rocks, that's my small rock group. I think rocks that are particularly flattish type rocks tend to appear in a particular orientation they're less likely to appear upright like this and more likely to be down like that so if I have a look at my rock now that I've got them let's orient them in a way that seems sensible to the shape of the rock at least initially it's not too important and bear in mind these are going to be tiny ones and the round rock doesn't really matter so much now the next thing I need to do is select them all and as you may remember from the trees rotate y90 and then that will be correctly oriented. And I'm just going to do the same with my large rock, which I haven't grouped yet. So control G, we'll change that to large rock group. They're not too bad in terms of orientation, but we'll move them around a little anyway, just to get them flatter. And again, then select them all, rotate Y. 90. So back to our landscape and you can see we've got them small rocks appearing, but they're not very small. In fact, they're huge. So let's 
make this a bit easier to see the rocks to begin with. I'm just going to select my rocks, come down here and I'm going to set a viewport color which is fairly bright yellowy color and then I'm going to do slightly different for the large rocks will go a fairly bright reddish color. That will just mean without actually looking at the material which can slow things down I can see where the rocks are when I just go to solid view. So there they are and they're a bit on the large side as you can see as well as being everywhere that I don't need them. So let's go to our particle system and first of all let's select grass and rocks as our vertex group. Now you can see they're where they should be, but still much too large for small rocks. So let's set this to 0.4. That's probably more like it, but of course they're all exactly the same size at the moment. Overall size of the particle is set to 0.05. So 0.4 hair length, that will affect the size of the rock, as will this size here. I need to put the random size up, and I'm going to put that all the way up to 1. So now I've got little almost grains of sand all the way up to just visible little pebbles. And now they're much smaller, there really needs to be a lot more of them. So let's click advanced. And before we increase the number, come down here and click rotation. We'll select normal for the initial orientation, but then we'll put some randomness on it just so that the rocks aren't completely the same in terms of how they're stuck in the ground, especially these small ones. We'll put phase up to one and we'll put random up to one. And that just rotates them relative to their initial orientation again, because otherwise you'll tend to get the same rock appearing in the same rotation and that's not what we want obviously and now we can have some more of them so let's try 5000 rock the other thing i point out is that we've currently got an even distribution we certainly don't need that so that'll make it a bit more random and i'm going to go for a random distribution as well and then we can play with the seed here just to give us different patterns and see what they look like now strictly i really don't need lots of rocks up here but i'm not going to worry too much about that so you can remove those from the vertex group that's defining that but what we're ready to do now is add the large rock so let's do that new particle system we we'll call this large rocks initially I'm just going to click here and select small rocks because it's basically the same settings but don't forget to click this little two works just the same as materials in order to make this a unique particle system and now we'll change the name of this to large rocks as well we certainly don't want 5,000 large rocks so let's just put this back down to say 500 come down here and let's select the large rock group down and the size Put that up to one. Let's go for a different seed as well. You can see there they are. That's the ones that I gave it a slightly different color to. We don't necessarily want a random size that goes down to one. So we'll set that to 0.5 thereabouts. And then we can start to increase the size of them. So we don't want them too big, but we want them a little larger. And we can play with the seed to get them around. Perhaps we want a little bit more variation in the size than that. The other thing it doesn't do when you create a new particle system is it forgets that you also want to control the length or density of the rocks with the vertex group. So let's select the grass and rocks there. Now you can see we actually don't need quite as many as that. So let's drop down to 250 and perhaps go down to 0.1 on the initial orientation and just try a few different distributions slightly smaller again. So now if we call up our water and then our large trees, that's not too bad. We'll go with that for now. So we've got our large rocks, we've got our small rocks. We're now ready to add some grass. So there's two elements to the grass that I'm going to do. They're both particle systems, but one's going to use assets, objects to create the grass that you can see near to the camera or some of it. And then I'm going to create grass at a distance. And in fact, I think we'll do the grass at a distance first. So the grass at a distance, obviously we can't see the detail on it. So we can actually get away with just using a hair system. I'm going to go up to my particle system and turn my rocks off now and I'm going to add a new particle system and we'll call this distant grass and I'll call it that down here as well again it's obviously a hair system we'll go for 0.1 on the size at the moment and this point I'm going to come back to materials and I'm going to add a new material and we'll call this distant grass We'll just make this a basic green material at the moment. Put it that color in the viewport as well. And that's the second material for the ground. It's worth noting that. So under render, you can see we've got ground selected there. If I click here, you can see distant grass comes up. So we can now select distant grass and now all the little blades of grass are visible. By default, it's a path and that's actually what we want for this. I'm going to select strand render, which is theoretically a more efficient way of rendering hair like this. But I'm going to come down here and just say grass and rocks because we obviously don't want it where we don't need it. Click advanced and come down to rotation. And the temptation is to leave it as hair. But of course, grass, like most plants, will tend to want to grow vertically, however successful it might be in that. So we'll say global Z, but then we'll put a tiny little bit of random on it. Not sure how much it does, but I'm 
always turn the phase and random up anyway. So let's go to rendered view. I'm going to bring the sun up there. So you can see I've got the grass coming up near as well. I'm going to change that in a moment. But you can see what the grass looks like close up. The so grass typically doesn't come to a complete point. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. But it's very often been cut or broken at some point. So we don't need to have a closed tip. So I've turned off closed tip from here down the bottom. So if we turn the size of the tip up, you can see it's starting to get a blunt tip. Obviously it makes sense to have it narrow somewhat toward the end. Next it's worth putting a little brownie in on there. Not too much though. You can see a tiny amount makes it wobble quite a lot. But just a little bit. And we don't necessarily need five segments. This is the number of potential bends in the grass as it were. Or potential places where the grass can bend. So now we need to add children. So we'll click interpolated. And you can see there's a lot more blades of grass there now. Now when we render that will do a hundred times the number of blades of grass. At the moment it's displaying 10 times. Before we go any further though, let's look at clumps. So if you go up on the clump, you can see they sort of point towards a central point. Now grass actually grows the other way, it points away from a central point, but obviously we don't want to go too far. But that's starting to get the idea of a grass plant. So if we just go a little bit that way, each clump of grass is sort of pointing away from a given point. And then we can play with the shape. Probably see it better if I come out of rendered view. If we go that way on the shape, the grass is flopping outwards. If we go that way, it's coming upwards. So probably slightly that way isn't too bad. Let's go back to render view. You don't really see the full shape of the grass in the preview mode, unfortunately. We can then add some more randomness. Now by default, that's way too high. So let's just set the amplitude down to zero and then just go up a little bit. So this is just adding some variation. It's a curl, a radial, a wave and so on. It doesn't mainly matter what it is. The idea is from my standpoint, it's just adding a little bit more variation to how the grass is oriented and so on. And you can play with the frequency and so on. We're obviously not going to see this grass close up. That's not the point at all. We can add some noise to the clumping, by the way, and that's too much. So we'll go with point one again, adding some variation to it. If we click long hair, we'll get a few that sort of stick out. And increasing this number just adds more variation, getting more of an impression of what the grass is going to look like in the distance there. It's not a good material at the moment, of course. So we'll go with that for the moment, but we need to do something about the material now. So let's, as always, add the mid-principal shader. I'm now going to add an input node, which is a hair info node. And we're interested in the intercept element here. I'm going to add a color mix node. And we'll start off with quite a light yellow and we'll end up with fairly dark green. I'll take that into the base color over here. I'm going to take the output of the intercept node and put it into the factor and then I'm going to add my usual color ramp node into there. Now if I start to move this point downward you can see the green part of the grass is progressing down the blade of grass. Perhaps we'll go with ease and maybe we'll make that a little more yellow. So my thinking is that sort of gives you a little bit of variation on the grass where it's near the ground. We've got a sort of lighter color, maybe go even go with bee spline and where it's higher up, we've got a much darker shade of grass. I'm going to add an add shader and I'm going to add a translucent shader. I imagine you can do what I'm about to do using the transmission options down here. But so far, I haven't managed to get a satisfactory result using the principal shader. So I do it the way I've done it for a while using this add shader. So I'm going to put a translucent into the other side of that and take the color output here into my translucent shader. I'm also going to add from the color options a gamma node and just drop that there. I'll move this translucent shader down to here just to make it a little easy to see what's going on and then turn the gamma up a little bit. What that does is just darkens and deepens the color of any light that's passing through the blade of grass. So you can see We've actually got some reflection on it already and turn the roughness down a little bit. So it's slightly shinier grass and that just gives us some little highlights. And this is now about balancing all the different elements to it. So I'm going to make the grass slightly bigger. So I'm going to select B spline here, which should give us a slightly smoother shape. And we'll go with four steps. I'm going to add a bit more randomness now to the size of each blade of grass. Not too much because it starts to get a little weird otherwise. Now I've just increased the segments just to make the grass a little smoother in its curves. And would perhaps turn Brownian down to 0 0.005. When you change some of the parameters of a hair system, you may find it just distorts wildly. It's a little bit sensitive, so you just need to go back through and basically generally turn down some of the settings that you've got. So 
So probably we turn the, this amplitude down to 0 0.002 maybe. There, that's stood the grass up a little bit more. So let's go for hair length 0.15. See, that's a bit bigger. Now, bearing in mind, we're not going to see this grass close up. I'm now going to make it a little thicker. So I'm going to go down to the bottom here. and We'll make the root 1.2. So this is the thickness at the base. Go for 1.25 and that will help it to cover better. Obviously, close up, it doesn't look like grass, but it looks somewhat grass-like at a distance. I'm just reducing the intensity of that colour a little bit there. I really want to look at some grass and get this quite close to it. Or you can use an actual grass image. So let's turn the density up now. So let's go for 5,000 base particles. And we can play around with whether it's vertices or faces. Sometimes vertices is better, but usually faces is fine. I think it needs even more than that. So we'll go with 9,000. Bearing in mind that this is just a preview screen, if I bring the water up now, that's 9,000 particles. And in the preview screen, that's multiplied by 10. So that's 90,000. And in the actual render, obviously, that will be 900,000. Currently, it's a very consistent color. So what we probably want to do now is add another color mix node. I'm not too worried about the yellow at the bottom there. Come up a little bit. But what we can do now is perhaps have some patches of more brownish grass, feed that into that color and then add texture, which is a noise texture. Use the factor output of that to go into there. We'll add a color ramp into that as well so that we can play around with it. This is set to B spline, of course, and we'll turn the scale up a little bit. So now you can start to see we're getting patches of grass. So we can now just determine whether we want most of the grass the brownish colour or most of it the greenish. I think I'm going to go for cardinal as well. Maybe a slightly larger scale or in other words smaller on the noise texture and perhaps turn the detail up as well. Now we'll go to ease I think, we'll try that. Or maybe we'll just go with a slightly different colour of green. I still think this green is a bit too intense. So we'll go with that. And now if I come down to the density options, we don't want this grass to be visible close to the camera because obviously it doesn't look that grass-like. So I'm now going to say just canvas distant. So that's now the same amount of grass, but it's taken this out of the options. So it's all just visible there. Very neat grass at the moment. So perhaps we need to make it a bit less uniform. If we click child simplification, this may help as well when we're editing particularly. And essentially, if it's too far away to be seen, then it will just not render that piece of grass. It's not making any real difference at the moment. And if we click viewport, generally it will only really show when you render. So I'm going to take that off for the moment. So I'm just playing with the random option under velocity, which is the same thing as the hair length. So you can now see it's making the grass a little more rough, but I think I'll now make the overall size slightly smaller. And I'm now going to turn that grass off because we're now ready to do the grass that's close to the camera. So I've imported from my previous scene just some assets rather than just go through building them. They're very simple. You can see I've created some basically grass plants here and they're just very simple planes extruded and then a texture added onto them. In this case, I've used a holly leaf texture, but it's just really to give it some little bit more than just a plain color. And then there's some other variations added in. It looks quite complicated, but that's because I haven't used the principal shader for this one. This is an asset I made quite some time ago, but it all basically does the same thing. If I go back to the grass texture, I should have, should probably go through and just explain what everything's doing again. And essentially that other texture on my grass asset is working in pretty much the same way. The only difference is this little bit here. So I've got a node here which tells me where we are when we're creating the color for the hair particle, where we are along the strand, are we at the beginning? Or towards the end. So that creates effectively a black and white color gradient that I look at with the color ramp and that just sort of gives me a, a control over the contrast as it were of that color gradient. That then controls the mix between this bright yellow color and whatever color I've got in here. We'll come back to this other bit in a minute and that goes into the basic color of the grass through a gamma node which darkens and intensifies it and a translucent node and that then gets mixed together. So any light passing through or any light being reflected off is added together to make our material. We've decreased our roughness a bit to make sure there's a bit of shine. This little bit here, we've just got a noise texture going through a color ramp to, so that we can play with how sharp the 
fall off between one part of the noise and another is. And then that's mixing between these two colors, which is sort of dim yellow color and a greeny color, which is what's being used for our main grass color. And that's just to give us some variation of the grass across the scene. So the grass assets, apart from the hair particle intercept analysis, intercept number, that's all very much working in a similar way. I've got some randomness added on there for, which I've used on the trees, for the object, you can see object info random, and that's to give us some different color grass between one grass plant and the next. And as I say, these are just planes that I've created and then extruded and just added some bends to them and so on, and then put them together at roughly the sort of look of what I think a grass plant should look like. They're by no means accurate. So we then, once you've made a few of those, you can make, see I've made some smaller squatter ones and some taller ones that are a bit wider, and each one's slightly different. Control G as before, and we'll call that grass group. So we're now ready to make some grass with those assets. So we'll just click plus again, we'll call this near grass and there, change it to hair particles, immediately come down and we'll just select vertex group, which is canvas, which is our nearby ones, of course. We'll go to group and we will select our grass group. You can see at the moment it's a little on the large side. So we'll go to a hair length of 0.5, see what that's like. That's closer to where it should be. We'll select rotation and pick random. And as usual, they've appeared the wrong way around. That's normal with this current version of Blender and previous versions. I don't know whether 2.8 will behave the same. So I'll select all my grass plants, rotate Y90. It's always, that's all you need to do is rotate Y90 and then they'll be back up the right way. So we'll click advanced, make sure we use modifier stack just in case we add any modifiers and click rotation. And we'll select global Z for our rotation eight. See, they're all pointing upward. We'll then add a tiny amount of random just so they're not completely identical. We'll put phase at maximum and random phase at maximum. We'll turn off even distribution, we'll turn on random. So we'll turn on children at interpolated. Now that's 10,000, which is possibly a little too much because that's 10 times a thousand. So we'll put both of them down to perhaps five. So we're gonna get the same number in the, in the viewport as we'll get on the final render. We do want long hair, we do want a lot of variation, and we'll start to turn uniform up. It's counterintuitive. Actually, a higher number against uniform gives you more randomness, or more variation in the children, the size of the children. So perhaps 0.25 there. And now we'll come to velocity and we'll put random on the velocity. So we'll put randomness on the size there and perhaps change the size down a little bit as well. When you're using children for hair particles, it's a balance between creating lots of children, but they're all copies of a relatively few number of parents, as it were, and creating lots of parents and only a few children. You really don't want too few parents. I could put sort of one or two parents here, but even with interpolated, that's going to look a bit odd because the children will always tend to inherit the characteristics of the parents. So what I mean by that, if you've got one particle and you select simple children, then all it's going to do is create a few copies of that one and distribute them around it at a slightly random distance. So they'll all be identical. It's not quite true if you select interpolated. It will actually look at more than one particle and try and create particles whose parameters are somewhere between the two parents. So there will be some variation and it will Sort of vary between nearly identical to the first parent to nearly identical to the second parent it will vary how much it is close to one parent or the second depending on where it's positioned but it will still look slightly odd if you have a lot of children and only a very few parents so you need to sort of get that balance about right so i'm going to put the number of parents up now we'll go for 5000 now Obviously, this is sort of adding geometry, but it's particle geometry, so it's not too bad. So let's see how that renders. So that's not too bad. That's giving you a bit of a view of grass. Could probably do with being a little more dense. But the other thing I can do is actually darken the ground texture now, and then it's sort of less significant. So if I select the ground, I'm going to leave the grass visible at the moment. Go to materials, select the ground material. And generally, if you're doing grass on top of a ground texture, you want a relatively dark ground texture. So if you recall, I'm using several ground materials. If I mute that gamma node, you can see the ground quite bright. So I've unmuted it, but let's try 2.5. That's quite a lot. That will mean the color is very intense as well. And perhaps we'll add color mix node. We'll drop that in there. Make this a multiply node. And we'll set this 
slightly reddish color and we'll set it to very dark. So it's at 50% at the moment. I put this up to 0.9. You can see it's very dark indeed now. And notice we've got a bit too much reflection there, so I'm going to turn roughness up a little higher. So I'm going to leave it at that for now. You can now see that it's not really showing up as significant. We need to play around a lot more with the ground texture. So that will do for our near grass. We could possibly make it a little smaller. So perhaps go to 0.4 for the hair length. But it does show more ground through it when you do that. But I'm not going to worry too much. I'm going to turn off those particles now. And I'm going to just add one more asset that I've already created. Again, done very simply, and it's these up here. So I just created some very, very simple, very primitive little flowers. You can see where they are there. One thing I did do, I'll just briefly show you. You can see I've got an attribute here called coal, and you can see I've got this sort of shading in the center of the flowers here. Flowers are just created very simply out of planes and a little tube there. Don't really need to show you how to create that by this point. I actually used an array just to spin the petals around, but in order to get that shading in the middle, what I did was go into vertex paint mode, go to select paint and just apply dirty vertex colors. And you can do that a couple of times and it gives you this sort of shading on it. You can imagine it as where dirt might collect. And there's a variety of different ways you can use that. And that automatically creates vertex colors here under the term coal. So you can then add an attribute. There is a default attribute under inputs, which is the coal attribute. But obviously you can change that to anything you want if you want several of these. I'm then processing that through a color ramp and you can see I've got different colors in here. Through a gamma node, I just wanted to be able to darken it a bit, although I ended up not doing so. And then that goes into the diffuse color into my mix shader. You can see I'm not using the principal shader here. Got a glossy going into that mix shader and I'm using layer weight to blend between the diffuse color and the gloss and the glossy. And I'm adding in a darkened version of the color with this translucent node. And that's then going out to my surface. And that adds together just to give me that little effect within the flowers. So basically made some simple flowers. We'll group those together and we'll call those flower group. These assets will be made available to my patrons in Patreon, but they're very easy to make anyway, and you can certainly download others very easily if you're struggling to assemble these. They don't really need to be massively detailed, but I think they just add a little bit. And certainly if you want to make a more realistic scene, you will probably want to make quite a few different assets, such as different plants with different leaves and so on. I've kept this to a relatively small number. So at this point, I go to my particle system again, new particle system, and we'll call this flowers. And I'm actually going to use the near grass as the starting point, but don't forget to click the little two because we don't want to mess up the near grass one. And we'll change that to flowers. We don't really want that many flowers, so I'll come back down to a thousand for the moment. We'll turn off children and we'll use grass and rock so that we've got flowers both here and there. And we'll change this to flower group. And again, they're lying the wrong way. So we'll select our flowers. Rotate Y90, and now they're facing the right way. I'll perhaps increase the randomness on them a little bit, so they're not all the same size. Make sure phase and random are at maximum and at rotation. And then let's have a look at how they look in the grass itself. So we'll bring up the near grass. And they're just peeking through the grass, which is just what we wanted. So I'll turn those off now, and I'll bring up my near trees. So I'm going to put some ivy on this tree, I think. So I'm going to click the 3D cursor just there. And hopefully that's appeared right next to the tree, which it has. That's important. So just make sure that you've got the Ivy generator add-on enabled. So go to user preferences, click in here and type Ivy. Make sure add curve Ivy gen is available. And the fact that it's a curve tells you where it's gonna be. It's very much like the sapling generator in that respect. Put your 3D cursor at the base of the place where you want the Ivy to appear. So in this case, at the base of a tree. And then select an object. Now, if you select the ground, the Ivy is gonna run along the ground. It's fine if that's what you want, but I want it to run along this tree, so I need the tree to be selected. So it will appear where the 3D cursor is, but it will run up the object that I selected. So now go to add curve, add ivy to mesh, and now you can see it's run up there. Don't change anything else at the moment because you can see over here on the left hand side, we've got some settings that we can play with. So we've got a random seed that we can play with here. Nothing changes initially until I say update ivy, and then you can see this gray mass over here 
changed. And you can see it's creating leaves as well as a stem. There's a lot of different parameters in here and the best thing to do is to play with them, but there are some that will affect it more than others. So you can see leaf probability here, that increasing that number, it's at 35% at the moment, will obviously give you more leaves. And leaf size obviously is the size of the leaves, so I've just increased those a little bit. And click update ivy, you can see that's much bigger leaves now. I'll go back down again and update ivy and they go back down. Float length is basically how sometimes the branches will, will move away from the object that they're supposed to be climbing up and it's how far it can go while doing that. Max adhesion length, how much it's attracted to the object that it's trying to climb up. So if I put that at 0.5 and then say update, you can see it just changes the shape a little bit. Let's increase the float length to say 0.75 so it can go further while not actually attached to something. So how likely it is to go in a random direction and a random weight. So it's 20% at the moment. Let's go to 35% or 0.35 and update it. That's actually made it shorter because this is sort of like timing. It runs for a certain period of time along a given direction and it does that a certain number of times before the simulation stops and says I finished now. And that's why it talks about waiting and so on. So if we increase IV size, so that's now 0.05 and click update, you can see it's a more spindly plant. If we come down, say 0.01, update it, it's a much more, much denser plant. So perhaps we'll go with 0.03, maybe not even that. 0.025, that seems fair. So you can play around with it, but basically when you've got what you want, let's select the plant itself. I'm just going to select the bark texture because that's as good as any to use for the stem and then we need the leaf texture so I'm going to go to close leaves initially and then click this little five symbol here just to say I want a unique leaf texture so ivy leaves I'm going to bring up the node editor alt c go to my ivy stem and select alt c and say mesh and curve then select my ivy leaves then select my ivy stem and just join them. You can't join a mesh to a curve, although you could group them, of course. And the reason I did that is I just want to play around very easily with the position of my IV. And before I do that, I'm going to go to Transform Origin to Geometry, because it just tends to be a bit random, and then just move my IV down. It's already sort of set up to be attracted to the tree, so it doesn't matter too much. I didn't want too much stem visible. So if we go to Material now, you can see we've got a silly leaf visible there at the moment. I'm going to make sure I've got my ivy selected and make sure it's that the bark texture is unique. So I will just call that ivy. And then I'm going to change the color to a sort of more greenish color for the ivy stem and go to the ivy leaves. And we've got this quite complicated setup that we created for the tree. The first thing I want to do is change the leaf texture. I happen to have an ivy leaf texture here. And there it is. But it doesn't have an alpha, but I do have another texture, which is a mask. So I've just created a duplicate of that image texture. I just take the same mapping node to there, to it. So take the same mapping node to that texture. Open that texture up and you can see I've got this here, which is a mask I created for this image. Open that one and I'm going to take this output to that node there. So that's now controlling which part is transparent. Go to rendered view now. You can now see I've got some quite nice ivy there. Perhaps change the color a little bit. And that looks pretty good. So it's time to give it a render. I'm just going to stop the recording while I do that because it's going to be quite a lot to render. So that's an initial render just at 25 samples. And you see it's not too bad. We've got a slight artifact appearing here and that's because of the clumping I've applied to these particles and the fact we're creating so many child particles from them. So effectively that's each of these is a clump of grass. It's quite an interesting effect but it's not quite what we want. And to sort that out, you just really need to reduce the amount of clumping that's going on. Uh, perhaps make it minus 0.1, something like that. The flowers probably need to be a little bit smaller. You can see there's our ivy appearing over here. And maybe we need a bit more grass uh, in the near scene in order to just hide more of the ground. Perhaps increase the size of the rocks as well because we can't really see any of them. But I guess the main thing just to point out now is that we want to add a little bit of feeling of distance into the scene and perhaps improve the quality of the image slightly without too much increasing the render time. That only took about just under three minutes to render so that's not too bad. The obvious thing to do is to increase the number of samples and we can do that but you can also use for a scene like this while this, where there's no volumetrics or movement really in it we can apply denoising. 
Generally just the default options will work. I usually turn the strength down a little bit, say 0.25, something like that, because it can take away some of the fine detail like little reflections and so on. By default, you will normally have the Z pass or Z pass switched on. Now what I'm about to do, you can use something called a mist pass for, but I've experimented with both. And certainly when you're using alpha textures, I find the Z pass is a better one to use than the mist pass at least with this version of Blender. So fortunately it's already done a Z pass, so I can now call up the node editor, click here and say use nodes. And by default, I just get my render scene and my composite output. And the Z pass is the depth output of my render layer. So if I just take that and put it into my composite output, you can just about see it looks like a very, very foggy scene. So I'm gonna add a color ramp in there now, and then start to play with the nodes. But you can see initially nothing happens. And the reason for that is because the variations are actually larger than one, the number one. Color ramp is designed to work between zero and one, so it can't do anything with this initially. So if I add a new node, which is a vector node called normalize, drop that in there, you can see it becomes much darker and we can now see what's going on in the scene. And basically all that's done is it's rescaled the probably 0.255 values to 0.1 to values, values that we can make much more sense of. I actually quite like that look. If you ever wanted to create such a black and white foggy image, that's a really easy way to do it. So if I now put my color ramp back in there, I can now, as you can see, adjust things. So the idea is I now want to adjust it because I don't want any fog. I'm actually not really going to have fog as such, but I don't want any fog or mist in the close part of the scene because it's just too close for there to be any. So I want this to become just an outline. If I move this one, what this does is it removes any differentiation. So I can actually continue to bring this up and you can see now we can just see the trees and there they've gone black. So perhaps just the very closest trees, we just want to be tilting darker and then we can just brighten up the mist very quickly as it goes out if we wanted to, but I won't do that. I'm just going to go to ease, which just makes it a sort of softer transition. can even use B spline. Again, you'll need to tweak these values. So it's just to have an ability to define, I think I'll go back to ease, where the scene starts to become slightly misty. So let's put our original image back in there. I'm going to go to my color options and add a color mix node. Drop that there. I'm going to make this a slightly blue color and we'll say lighten. So as we turn that up, you can see the scene starts to become sort of slightly blue and washed out. So I'm going to take the output of my color ramp and put that into the control. And you can see it at this extreme, that's how much it affects it. So just tweaking it a little bit there. And if I now darken this, you can see the overall effect is reduced. I can also use that color ramp controller hue saturation node. If I put that in there and apply this to saturation, I'm going to need to scale it because obviously that's too much. I want saturation at one normally. So if I add a math node and say subtract, put a value of one in there, put the output of my color ramp on the other side, then take that into saturation. Now you can see that everything that's close by is in full color. Everything that's far away is quite a bit reduced. All I now need to do is add another math node, set it to multiply and just reduce that number so that the amount of the impact on saturation is reduced. So if that's at one, it's pretty, it's almost black and white in the distance. I can make it even worse by making it larger. If it's at zero, then it has no effect. So it's just basically saying as things get further away, the intensity of the color is reduced and that's actually what really happens in real life as painters will tell you. Finally just to sort of focus the attention make it a little more interesting and give some more variation let's just add a mask which is an ellipse mask initially just drop it straight in like that set the width to 1 and the height to 0.5 put it there add another color mix node set it to mix put the image on the bottom put the top to black Control it with the output from the ellipse mask and then add a filter, which is a blur filter into there. Set it to fast Gaussian. Click relative, which just basically adjusts for the fact that 
it's a wide image rather than a square one. And then perhaps try 15%. And if it's still too dark around the edges, an easy way to adjust that is just to make it bigger, the actual blur amount. And you can even make the width blip bigger as well. It sort of pushes it off to the edges. So you could go for 1.1 and 0.65 maybe. So all that's done is it's just darkened the outer edge. And then we can put a color balance node on, play with the overall brightness of the scene and the color balance, obviously. And generally, certainly for an autumnal scene, a somewhat more red scene is probably what you want. So I've increased the amount of red and again, I've increased the amount of blue under lift very slightly. And then you can play with the overall brightness of that element here. And if you press M, you can mute a node and see whether it's better or worse than what you had. We can also manage the noise, of course, by some of our settings under rendering. So I'm going to put this up to 50 samples, which is still not very many. I'm going to clamp at seven. So there's no real volumetrics in this scene. So I'm going to clamp at seven. This is basically clamping any bright or sudden changes between a, a very bright dot and a very dark dot or extreme of red to green, that sort of thing. It won't allow very big changes between one pixel and the next, essentially. Light sampling, this makes it render more quickly if it's bigger than zero but it means it adds more noise. So generally I'll set that to zero unless I'm really trying to get the fastest render I can get, which is usually when I'm doing animation. But for a still image, you don't need that. For a still image, I'm sure it's fine if it takes several hours ultimately, but that's still not a huge number of samples there. So it's, it's fine. The other thing I was going to do was just select my ground again. Let's turn off the visible grass. Let's turn on the visibility of our flowers. And let's just decrease the size slightly. And we were going to increase the amount of grass as well for near grass. So we'll go for, at least under the render, we'll go for eight children per parent. So I'll stop the recording again and give that a final render. And there we are with the final render. Obviously, this was just the one I created for the tutorial. I haven't put as much work into this as I did the other one. Still needs a little bit of work around the artifacts for the grass in the distance. I haven't increased the size of the rocks and stones, so they're still not really showing up. I have decreased the size of the flowers and increased the density of the grass here a little bit. One slight problem that came up was I was getting a CUDA error. Now, sometimes that can be because you've just run out of memory. The peak memory for this was just over two gigs, which is still within the amount of memory I've got in my NVIDIA graphics cards, which I think is two and a half gigs. But nevertheless, I was getting a CUDA error. And I've recently just found that sometimes that's rather than due to running out of basic memory for the cards for the render itself, because you've got so many particles or geometry in the scene, it's actually something to do sometimes with denoising. And I've found for my graphics card, a tile size, which is set down here, of 512 is optimal for speed. However, with the more intensive scenes with a lot more geometry and so on, I'll often get a CUDA error if I use denoising with a tile size bigger than 256. May just be some errors in the coding, I don't know, but certainly that's when I often get issues with that. So if you get a CUDA error and you're using denoising, try just turning denoising off first to see if the CUDA error goes away. If it doesn't, then obviously you've got the normal problem of there just being too much going on in the scene. You'd be able to render it with GPU rendering. So you'll have to switch to CPU rendering. But if it goes away, you may be able to continue using denoising by reducing your tile size. By default, this is set to automatic. I always click that little button and set it to a specific value in order to be able to control that. So if it's an animation, I'll generally set that to 512 because that's optimal for my card. But I think for a quick scene, that's not too bad. It's a relatively quick scene and you can obviously play around with that yourself. So I hope you found that interesting. If you did, let me know and I'll see you in the next tutorial. Thanks a lot. So I hope you found that interesting. If you did, let me know. If you enjoy these tutorials, don't forget to click like and subscribe. I also have a Facebook page and a Twitter account, and I now have a Patreon page as well. And I'll provide links to all of those in the description below. So I'll see you in the next tutorial. Thanks a lot.